Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash new music industry. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Today I'm chatting with wellness and career coach for women in music and host of the Out to Be podcast, Katie Zaccardi. How are you today, Katie? I am good. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, thanks for being on the show. You approached me with a very interesting topic, and we're going to be covering some topics that are of a special importance to musicians. Unfortunately, these subjects often don't get talked about until burnout creeps up on us or when we begin feeling those familiar pangs of anxiety or depression. And I say familiar because there is some evidence showing a link between the creative brain and depression. And for better or for worse, it seems common among creatives. So we're going to be getting into self-care and time management on today's show. Before we get into that, though, I'm sure my listeners would love to get to know you a little bit. So who are you and what are you up to, Katie? Yeah, so my name is Katie Zuccardi. Like you said, I am a wellness and career coach for women in the music industry. Um, I am, was, am an artist myself. I went to NYU for music business. So in my time in college, I was doing the indie artist thing while also learning so much about the music industry. And after college and after um, kind of starting my journey with anxiety, I just decided, you know what? One, I don't like working like at a normal job. (laughs) I kind of always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Two, why are people not talking more about mental health and anxiety and just wellness in general? Um, I have since then like really worked hard on dealing with my anxiety and other issues like allergies and stuff like that on a very functional medicine level. And I just think that we focus so much on sick care and not on well care. And especially in the music industry, we don't really do anything or make any changes until we're like full on burnout. So I just kind of decided, you know what, I'm going to talk about this. I feel like I experienced a lack of having support through that. I didn't know who to go to or what resource to turn to or anything like that. And so I wanted to be that resource for other people because I know that so many of us struggle with this and we just don't have to, you know, we don't have to. Yeah, it's very needed. You know, a few things by way of comment. I've heard it said before, take the green pill today or take the white pill later. In other words, you can do preventative care now and begin to live a healthy life so you don't end up having to take all these medications later on. Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) Uh, I definitely relate to the indie artist who is also interested in the business and and didn't want to work a normal job. It wasn't just that I didn't want to, it's that I wasn't any good at it. (laughs) Uh, The way I went through school, and it's it's how I ended up being, obviously, is that I would just go and do whatever I wanted to do and and made my own curriculums for myself. So I'd be like doodling or writing songs or putting together raps or a million other things while these, uh, while while these classes were going on. And and that's the way I went through school. And I still kind of do that to this day. Very relatable. I like that. (laughs) Um, And you framed this very well in your introduction email. So I'd like to tackle this whole thing of working hard. Now more than ever, the hustle culture is pervasive. And I think people by default end up tuning into the squeaky wheels who are shouting about working their faces off. There are Mm -hmm. a couple of pieces to this. But first, I'd love to hear how we can change our mindset around working harder and working all the time. Absolutely. And you know what's funny is that this is something that I've been today, like as we record the day of thinking about so intently, I just, I just drafted up a post about this because Mm. I think that we have, especially in the music industry, but in in culture, in our culture in general, we take this word hustling of like, you want to make it, you have to be out there hustling all the time. And there's a difference between like what hustling has become now and what simply working hard and working smart is. And I really believe that We should be working smart, but that doesn't mean that we have to like burn ourselves out and like work super hard and do all of this stuff in order to move forward with our music career. Because the way I see it, working smart can be, yes, you're networking, you're going to networking events, you're connecting with people. Yes, you're 
always learning about things that are relevant to you, but you're really clear on what your goals are. So you're learning things that will help you along with that goal. You're, you know, taking opportunities and doing tasks again, that are aligned with your goal and not just doing anything and everything in your career to move you forward. You're investing in yourself. And most importantly, you're taking time to rest regularly and to rest when you notice that, you know, maybe something happened or just whatever, the weather, it got cold and you feel like your body needs a little extra support, taking time to make sure that you're listening to your body and listening to your mind and taking a break when you need it. That's what I see as working smart. And that's what's going to get you to move forward in your music career. However, I feel that in our culture, we've put such a, such a focus on hustling. You have to be there. You have to be at every networking event. You have to be out there all the time, making connections, playing gigs, going out to other people's gigs, doing all this stuff. And I'm not saying like you shouldn't be doing that. And in fact, I think you should be doing that. But to an extent, like if you're not clear about what you're even doing and you're just doing like all of the things and going out every single night just to like make connections, but maybe you're not even talking to people or you're not talking to the right people or you're not like getting a genuine connection out of it. It's useless, but you're wasting your time and you're wasting your energy. And the same goes with tasks. I see so many artists come to me because they're just like, I I might even be clear on what my goal is, but I don't feel like I'm putting in the actions that are actually getting me there. Like I'm busy all the time. I have no time, but yet my career is not moving forward. And that's because there's a there's a big lack of clarity and a disconnect between what we're actually doing, like busy work and just tasks that aren't really moving the needle forward and what we should and can be doing to actually make a dent in our music career and actually move ourselves forward. And of course, the most important thing that hustling people who are like, quote unquote, hustling do is that they, they never stop, right? It's Mm -hmm. like, work hard, never take a day off, keep going, struggle, like, and that stuff, we glamorize it. And the thing is that that is not going to get you where you want to be. Because if you are doing that, you are going to burnout. And then that time that you're spent recovering from burnout is time that you would have been spending moving forward in your career in a productive way. So while it seems like harder to take the what might seem like the slower route or the less glamorous route because you're taking nights off and you're relaxing and stuff like that. And it feels like we shouldn't be doing that when we're trying to like be an artist and we're trying to work hard. That's ultimately the route that's going to get you further faster in the long run because you're not going to deal with burnout and you're not going to be taking actions that aren't actually getting you anywhere, but are just keeping you busy. Well said. And the question that I often ask my students is what is going to get you the results? Because I can't answer that question for anybody else. I yeah, exactly. What, I know what helps me get results. I can look at the data and the metrics and everything I've done over the last however many years and say, these are the things that I need to be focused on. And, you know, as they begin to examine that question, they can see that, oh, you know, I'm doing a whole bunch of other things over here. And it's really easy to go down those those holes, right, with online marketing or building sales funnels or or whatever it is, blogging even. You can go down so far and it, it works for some people and, and it is where they get the results. But for, for others, it's not at all. And they have to really be clear and identify which things are going to going to get something, get them. Yeah, going 100 percent. Yeah. yeah. And I, th- I think that's the big difference, too, that with a lot of people who are like, I'm out there. I'm doing all the stuff. It's like, okay, why are you doing all the stuff? Like, why are you like, (laughs) that doesn't make sense. Like you should get really clear on what your goal is and you're going to have to figure out and you're, you might have to mix and match. You might have to experiment with some stuff and see what works and what's, what doesn't work. But I can guarantee that doing everything is not what's going to get you there because a big part of everything is probably going to be useless to you or not what you really are excel at and not really what your audience resonates with. So why would you be doing everything if that's not going to make a difference? Yeah, I think it's becoming less and less so in this culture. Like maybe when when the internet was still new and people were just beginning to market, it was a different game. But I recently watched a video with Darren Hardy, who founder of success magazine. And the video was titled insane productivity, but he just stood there before this room and said, each and every one of you are doing exactly what you need to be doing. And yet only 12 to 15 people will ever appear on the cover of success magazine each year. So what's the difference between you and the difference between them. Hmm. And he said the one difference is focus. That's good. Yeah. That's so, good. Yeah, you're right. If you get too many, too, 
especially today, if you get too focused on too many things, you're not going to be able to keep up with it all. And you have to be cognizant of your genius zone and operate from there. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, as artists, we know, like I'm an artist, I'm good at this artist thing, but that being said, when you're marketing yourself, like, where do you excel? Are you a good writer? Are you better at speaking? Are you better at, you know, being on video, being on camera? And these things make a difference when you're thinking about promoting yourself and content and just growing and how you want to be interacting with people. And maybe you excel more at in-person connections than online or vice versa. And it's important to consider all of these things. Like what are your strengths? Because you want to leverage those strengths instead of just tapping into, again, tapping into like all of the possibilities out there, some of which will be your weaknesses or just not your strong suits and trying to make those work when in reality, you could just be spending way less time doing the things that you're good at. Yeah, exactly. I know that people like my coach, James Franco, focuses on speaking and talking rather than writing. So instead of blog posts, he'll do videos and podcast episodes. And for that matter, Rick Barker, uh, who's in this industry, is is up to the same thing. So uh, getting back to this piece about burnout, you know, from personal experience, I can say that burnout isn't much fun. And as I get Mm -hmm. into better routines, I've come to discover that it's very preventable. And it's not a requirement that you succumb to its willing and ravenous embrace. But it took a while for me to get to that point. And as I reflect on the last two or three years, I can see that I burned out at least three or four times, which resulted in massive productivity losses, mood swings and sinking morale. So what are some key things we need to focus on with self-care routines? Yeah, I think that one of the biggest ways to prevent burnout is just by regularly taking time for yourself and reducing your stress levels. Because usually burnout comes when we go weeks or months without really taking a break and without... just like relaxing and checking in with ourselves and doing what we need. And so then we just hit a breaking point where we were running on this adrenaline. We were like running on a high and we were go, go, going. And then eventually our body is like enough. I cannot take this anymore. Um, or our mind or both. Um, so by my favorite place to start really is with a morning or a nightly routine. And I think that's such an easy way to implement wellness into your life. You can again, start either in the morning or the night, eventually do both, but attaching it to something, right? Like I wake up and then I do this. Most of us wake up, go to the bathroom, brush our teeth. Okay. Then what? So maybe that's a good time to do some journaling or do some meditation or do some yoga or, um, read a book. Those are some great things you can do where we want to be creating some space and some just downtime in our lives. So we're not constantly like wake up, scroll on our phone while we pee, then like, I don't know, brush our teeth while listening to a podcast and like constantly multitasking, immediately jumping into work, doing all of this stuff instead, just like take a breather, take even five minutes a day to just spend with yourself away from technology and allowing yourself and your brain to rest while you're awake, right? That's the key. Obviously we're resting when we're asleep, but like how can you create space in your day in the time that you are awake and active? So that's a great place to start because we want to have something that's built into our day that allows us to relax and rest. And Sometimes we think that self-care or wellness has to be like, I have to get a massage, like an hour long massage every week or every other day or something. And (laughs) it's like, I don't have the time for that. How am I going to do that then? How am I going to self-care? How am I going to wellness? But it absolutely (laughs) doesn't have to be that. It can just simply be doing something that you enjoy, that you find relaxing and building that into your daily and weekly routines so that again, you have a place to fall back on. You know that Each day you have tools in your toolbox that will help you to de-stress instead of just going day by day feeling like I'm getting increasingly more stressed. So like maybe I should book a massage and that'll be my like respite from all of this. But (laughs) that's not necessarily how it's all going to work. I mean, go for the massage. Like I'm not anti-massage. Don't get me wrong. But it's more about the small things daily. Yeah, the experts sometimes say things like a body in motion stays in motion, right? Which I I get their point. Just the problem is that if your body's overloaded with adrenaline, you get something called thyroid fatigue and then eventually something called adrenal fatigue. So the body. Which I have. Exactly. Same. (laughs) Yep. And And how do you think I got here? (laughs) (laughs) I know. (laughs) 
<laughs> and that that leaves your organs uh, not working very well in, yeah. in in unison as they should be or in harmony as as they should be. So yeah, I mean, once you've reached that that point of fatigue, you're you're so much more vulnerable to to a lot of different things. You know, yeah. my routine, new routine anyway, is is basically. 90 minutes block of work followed by 30 minutes of breaks. And mm, that, that has resulted in anywhere from 30 minutes to 90 minutes of meditation in a day. And <laughs> it ends up becoming like a favorite pastime or like one of the favorite things to do during a break because I know I'm going to leave there feeling refreshed or better about my my circumstances my situation myself Mm -hmm. uh, versus where it used to be which was just a chore it's like I got to check that off my list too (laughs) meditation you mean yeah exactly yeah Yeah. and I think um a couple things you mentioned there I mean the first is like speaking on adrenal fatigue it's like for a lot of people they might not recognize what really happens when you do work yourself so hard and you don't ever stop? And it's yeah. stuff like this, right? It's like, clearly we're both here. Um, I actually haven't really talked about being in adrenal fatigue much, but it's something I've been working through for the last like a year almost because through college and in the several years since then, like I didn't even know it was really happening, but I was just working myself so hard and I was experiencing so much anxiety that now I can see that my stress levels, my cortisol levels, my blood sugar, all of that has been like severely impacted because of this. And so now it impacts me day to day. And it's something that I'm dealing with because at the time I didn't have the tools to deal with it and manage it, manage that stress as it was happening. So there are like actual long-term health effects, right? Aside from like chronic stress and that kind of stuff, like There are real things that can happen with your hormone levels, your energy levels, even your gut when you stay in this chronic state of stress. So that's just another reason why it's so, so important to make sure that you are managing it day to day. And of course, why I do what I do is because I want to help people avoid getting there or at least be able to work through it um, if they feel that they're on their way there. And the other interesting thing that you brought up was meditation and um I want to point out that meditation too, you know, if you're taking breaks throughout your day, it doesn't have to be that every time you take a break, you sit down and you like, you know, say ohm and cross your legs and like meditate with nothing, right? Sometimes it can just be like taking a walk, but not, you know, not like being on your phone. It can be doing the dishes, just silly tasks, like simple things, simple tasks that just allow you to take some downtime. It's, It doesn't have to be like a whole thing of meditation of like getting comfy in a seat and quieting your mind. But those things, even though we think, you know, we are doing something like we're walking or we're doing the dishes, those are really great ways to get into a meditative state. Something I like to do, too, is just like improv on the piano, like not really think about it, but just go to the piano and just like play whatever I feel like it, because then my mind is is quieting and I'm just kind of like letting my fingers speak whatever they feel like doing. So that's a great way too. But it really is so important. I love that you take 30 minutes every every 90 minute period to rest. I know for me, a great place to start too, especially for artists who are like, that sounds nice, but I like work a full time job. And then I like do my artist thing on the side. <laughs> it could be seem kind of unrealistic. And what I would say is just make sure that you're taking 30 minutes at least if an hour, if you have it for lunchtime to really focus in on your lunch and block everything out. I try to do that every day. I'm not going to say I'm perfect. Even today I noticed I was working through lunch cause I kind of got a late start and I was feeling kind of the momentum and I could feel that, you know, that feeling when you like have too much coffee, I don't really drink coffee anymore, but yeah. like, that's what it feels like for me. That's why I can't drink coffee anymore is cause I get it naturally sometimes when I get that high like cortisol and I have to calm it down. And it was because I was trying to eat lunch and also trying to like e- respond to emails and like post on Facebook and do all the stuff. And that stuff, like things like eating and things like just like making sure we're taking time to breathe, like do it without tech, do it without working. Just try to create space in the smallest ways possible in your day so that you're not constantly being stimulated. That's really the biggest thing. Yeah, I agree. Like any opportunity to disconnect from your devices. I think that's important. I take those times to, to, to exercise or play guitar or focus on something else as well. So it's not just meditation, but if I'm starting my day early and I didn't sleep that well the night before, then that's definitely 
ends up being a go-to for me is meditation. Yeah. Now, you know, for me, it's altogether too common that when the weekend approaches, I have the best intention to go to, for a drive, find a restaurant, get out in nature, get a massage, see a movie, attend an event I'm interested in, engage in my hobbies, or even just go to the local music store. I recently moved to uh, BC and there's so much to see, do and experience out here. But then sometimes I just end up staying in bed and binge watching Netflix for hours as I quickly lose daylight and any motivation to do anything. Such a stark contrast for some people I know who jump out of bed on the weekends because they're so excited about not having to work. So have you observed that behavior before? And is there anything you would recommend we do in an instance like that? The coach in me is wants to be like, well, why do you feel like that is? But, <laughs> but yeah, Good I mean, I think, yeah, I think that there's probably a lot of things that might trigger that. And some of Overworked. it is just, yeah, I mean, like we want to rest, right? So yeah. of course the key there is making sure that you are getting to bed earlier at a reasonable hour. You're getting enough sleep each day so that you're not waking up tired and then feeling the need to just like stay in bed throughout the whole weekend. But, um, one great way to combat that is is simply by just like getting up and doing it. Like just commit to doing one thing. And you don't have to commit to like a whole day of activities, but if you can commit to one thing and get up and start that one thing, it makes it so much easier to keep that momentum going. Mm. And so, you know, if you would just commit, okay, I'm just going to get up and I'm going to like go grab coffee with a friend and that's it. You'll find it a lot easier on most days to then be like, oh, we're going to go to this farmer's market or we're going to go on the walk or we're going to go to the music store or whatever. But making, you know, big extravagant plans when you're feeling depleted on energy and then you look at those plans and just think, <laughs> uh, yeah, that is like not going to happen, right? That can deter you from getting that head start. So I yeah. think a great thing to do, I mean, I always tell everyone, start with one thing, right? So for me, the one thing might just be start with getting enough sleep. Don't worry about anything else, but start with making sure that you're prioritizing sleep. Then once that you feel like you have that on lock, start with just picking one thing each weekend or each day that you're going to commit to doing and do that thing first. And then from there, most likely you will have the momentum and the enthusiasm to keep going. But if you don't, that's okay too. You know, if you feel like you need a rest, rest. If you want to spend the rest of the day watching Netflix, the crown just came out. So do what you hmm. got to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. There are no rules, but really it's just finding that momentum when you can have it and making those commitments to yourself to doing what you need to do, especially um, respecting your energy. And sometimes we do just need a day to binge watch TV. And sometimes we do need a day to get out in nature. Yeah. So it's just listening to you. Awesome. Great tips. I like it. Now, the next topic we need to handle here is time management, because a lot of people are going to hear your suggestions and say to themselves, yeah, that's great, but then make the excuse that they don't have the time or they just can't figure out how to fit it into their schedules. And I've been there too, but I recognize that staying in that mode was ultimately unproductive, just wasn't consistent with what I'm out to accomplish or who I say I am. But let's get into this time management piece. What can mm -hmm. we do to better manage our time? And why is it so easy to end up feeling like where we've wasted our entire day when we've attempted to take it by storm. Yeah, well, that's such a key thing you said is like what you've set out to accomplish. And I think that the biggest problem that I see with those who are struggling with time management is that they have a lack of clarity of what they're actually trying to accomplish and a lack of clarity on what their priorities are. And these priorities go beyond music, but they also go into life and wellness. So I'm sure, you know, a lot of artists have a lot on their plate. It's just kind of a fact. But the truth is, oftentimes we can figure out, one, are some of the things on my plate things that I really want on my plate? Or can I get rid of them or delegate them to someone else? And then two, looking at the things that you have committed to or that are in your life right now and really clearly decide what is a priority for me. And that makes it a lot easier to figure out how you're spending your time. So I'll give an example of just my life. I am full-time entrepreneur and coach. I also volunteer for Women Crush Music, which is a nonprofit. Mm. And I have, you know, my own personal and life and wellness goals. So for me, when I sit down and plan my schedule, I start with scheduling in my yoga classes. Mm. And this is because if I don't go to yoga, 
I go a little cray cray. My, <laughs> my neck starts to hurt. My shoulder starts to hurt. Like I've had chronic pain there my whole life. Um, I start oh. to notice I get a little bit more anxious, a little bit less able to just deal with stuff calmly. Like I want to, so going to yoga helps me really tap into the person who I want to show up as if I don't go, I'm not that person, right? <laughs> I'm not like my best self, so to say. Mm. So I schedule in my yoga first because that's a priority for me. Then I will schedule in on the work side, client calls because my clients are the number one priority as far as work goes. Then I'll also schedule in any recurring tasks that I have. Um, so any things like just getting back to emails, content creation, podcasts, work, things like that. Those are all on my calendar as recurring tasks. And then from there, I have a pretty bare bones, right? I'll add in my woman crush time and I'll add in any other calls like those things will be put into the cracks of my schedule and the cracks of my day. And of course, time with friends and family. Now that's kind of for me automatically reserved on the weekends. Like I don't do any work on the weekend nights because that's when I spend my time with friends and family. But, um, as you can see, I kind of go in order of priority. What do I want to do? If I'm working on a special project, then that extra time in my schedule that's not for yoga, for you know myself, or for friends and family, or for my clients will be dedicated to that project. And so if somebody wants to have a call about a collaboration or somebody wants to talk to me about that and my schedule is feeling pretty packed, sorry, that's not a priority for me right now. I have to focus on what is. So let's reschedule for a couple weeks down the line, You know, circle back when I have more time to deal with it. And I don't feel bad about saying no to those opportunities. I think that's a common thing that artists struggle with is I feel like I want to focus on recording my album, but I keep getting asked to do this thing or this show or whatever. And I, I don't know if I should say no, like I don't want to pass up, but when you're really clear on what you're trying to accomplish, you'll know, does this fit into my schedule? Is this something I feel good about doing? And is this something that I want to dedicate my extra time to if I even have extra time? And that makes it a lot easier to make that decision and figure out, how to balance your time and how to use any extra time that you do have. Absolutely. I think there's definitely a sort of a dividing line between when you should say yes more often than not, and then when you should say no more often than not. And and many people will begin with no opportunity or no gigs or no recording contracts or anything like that. And then that's the right time to say yes to things that other people are saying no to because they're missing an opportunity, but that opportunity may not be at the level that they are aspiring to be. And so for you to take it is, is good. But then, you know, your schedule gets fuller, your commitments uh, begin to add up and you're in a variety of projects. And then that's the right time to begin saying no. And, and that's something I've definitely had to make more of a point of in the last few years. Uh, it, it served me for a while saying yes to everything. And uh, it's not serving me as much these days. Yeah, it can be fun to say yes, right? And it feels like we don't want to miss out on potential opportunities. But yep. ultimately, often when we feel like we have to say yes to everything, it's because we're not really clear on what we're going for. And like I said, when you're clear on what you're going for, you'll your radar for figuring out if this opportunity is going to serve you or not will become a lot better. <laughs> like you'll be better to you'll be better able to identify that stuff, and so it'll become easier to say no. But being a yes man, like it's great to take on new things, but you want to be mindful of not only yourself and your own time, but of what you are truly working towards. Like I said, if, if you're working towards recording an album for 2020 and somebody asks you to play a Christmas show that you don't really want to play, but you feel like you have to say yes, don't say yes. Like nobody's forcing you to do that. And it doesn't align with what you are really working towards and what you want your time to go to. You don't want to have to waste your time rehearsing Christmas songs and, you know, preparing for this gig that wasn't on your radar just because someone asked you to do it. Christmas comes again every year. So <laughs> like, you'll have another chance. Yeah, the world's unlimited. So there's plenty of opportunities to go around. Now, for something a little bit harder, you know, it so often happens that we start our days with the idea of tackling that thing that's kind of been nagging at us for days, weeks, or even months. But then at the end of the day, we feel like so exhausted or distracted that we just end up leaving it for another day. Do you have any tips for our procrastinators out there? Yes. Eat the frog. I think that's yeah. what they call it. Do the hard thing first. So if there's something you're procrastinating, do it first thing of the day so that you don't have time to procrastinate. Uh, I would also say, depending on what this task is, if it's like a larger project, 
break it down so that you're looking at smaller tasks and then you can just tackle one of those smaller tasks each day. That way it's not so intimidating and it's not like, oh, I have to like plan this whole thing. I don't even know where to start. So I'm just avoiding it. Take a day or take a an hour to just break down, okay, what do I need to do to make this happen? Step one, do this, then do this. And then put in your calendar, first thing for every day, one action item from that list so that you're slowly moving forward. And once you start really getting progress, it'll make it a lot easier to not procrastinate that because you'll see like that you're, that you're moving forward, right? And that makes it easier. But t- so two things is break it down and eat the frog. Do it first thing, just get it over with. And that, I was going to say suck it up, which it sounds kind of like, it's a little hard ass of me, but, but really like you kind of just got to sometimes just, wake up and bite the bullet and just do it. And you will feel better once you've done it because it won't be weighing on your shoulders anymore. Annoying as it may be. That, that's what I suggest as well. And I think it's, isn't it wonderful that the universe is letting you know that that's the thing that you have to do. It's just nagging at you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all the signs are there. You don't need, you don't need any more signs. Yeah. And the other thing I would say too, is that if you feel like you're avoiding it because there's something else um, going on, like maybe you really, really, really don't want to do this task for whatever reason, or you literally don't know how, or you don't know how to do it in like a time savvy way. Cause you know, if you did it, you'd have to like spend hours on Google or YouTube trying to figure out what to do. Then that's a great time to call and help either see if you can outsource it or see if you can, um, get a coach or, or do a, a course or a program how to get this done quickly and easily and give you accountability along the way as well. So some stuff, it is just like we avoid it because we're just not even sure where to start. And usually without like getting someone else in there to help you, you're not going to just randomly know, like, oh, I suddenly know where to start, even though I had no idea before. Yeah. Like that's sometimes when we need to just bring in help, call and help. Yes. I don't know if anybody else in the music entrepreneurship space is teaching this, but I talk about the three eights. So it's automate, eliminate, or delegate. And if you can put it on autopilot by using a tool, you do it. If you can eliminate that task completely and don't have to do it, perfect. If you can delegate it to somebody else who, who is more... Let's say, you know, they're, they're all right with handling tasks that aren't as high level as they should be, uh, then, then do that. And so there's, there's options for sure. If you got to do it, then you got to do it. There's no way around that. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And like we talked about earlier, like everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. And even looking at a group of artists, some people might be better at one thing and, but, and others better at another. So Sometimes that's a great opportunity too to be like, hey, I'll do this thing for you if you do this thing for me because I know that I can get that thing that you hate done super easily and you can do the thing that I hate super easily. (laughs) So, you know, it doesn't always work. But again, that's where just like calling in help, it helps because you're not expected to be an expert in everything and that's okay, but other people might be and might be able to help you. That's a really great tip as well. Something else that I need to ask about is your journey with anxiety. Again, I feel it's common that creatives encounter anxiety, whether it's mild or extreme or some shade in between. I've shared before about how I pushed myself too hard in 2008 and ended up having a panic attack with two months, within two months of pushing myself and overdoing it. Now, you talk about having to learn your triggers and coping mechanisms. And interestingly, I wasn't even aware of some of my triggers until years later. So I would love to hear what happened with your anxiety and the healing path path you've been on? Yeah. So my anxiety journey really started in college and it honestly, it went on for a few years before I really noticed that something was actually wrong. You know, for a while I was like, "Eh, maybe this is low blood sugar. Maybe it's panic attack. We don't really know. We're just going to kind of roll with it. Mm. Um, and so things were unsure. I, from the very beginning, without even knowing what it was, I cut out coffee and I pretty much cut out alcohol. I don't drink alcohol at at all anymore because I did notice that those two things would trigger stuff, um, particularly just body reactions and they just wouldn't go well with my system. And, you know, whether it was low blood sugar or something hormonal going on, not feeling well for me would trigger anxiety anyway. So even if it didn't start as anxiety, it usually ended up as anxiety. So, Mm. um, those were a couple things that I started with. And that was because I noticed there were a few instances where I would feel like really shaky, basically have a panic, panic attack, feel really shaky, hearts pounding, like clammy, things like that. And 
eventually I was able to track it. There was one incident that happened while I was in college and I just knew that it was anxiety that I was feeling. I was supposed to be going to my friend's 21st birthday party. I, my birthday is in December. So I was like the last person to turn 21. So I wasn't 21 yet. And I, I recognized that I was just having a lot of anxiety over, I didn't want to like ruin her birthday. I don't want to not get into the place or like have to hold anybody back or anything like that when we were going out. And especially during that time, I was in a place where I wasn't really drinking because of all of this, but I wasn't also saying like, I don't drink, leave me alone kind of thing. So I would experience a lot of like, I don't want to call it peer pressure, but just like annoying people (laughs) when I was out and, you know, people trying to get me to drink and constantly having to explain myself. And so it was one night where this party was happening and I just had a panic attack and I was like, I, I know nothing. This is nothing else but anxiety. Like nothing, you know, there's nothing that would have triggered low blood sugar. There's nothing that would have made me feel sick or anything like that, but I don't feel well. And I know that I'm subconsciously really stressed out about this. So, um, that kind of, for me triggered like a three day panic attack. I ended up going to the doctor for my yearly checkup anyway, and explain what happened. And at that point they were like, yeah, sounds like you have an anxiety disorder. So, Hmm. um, as silly as it might sound, that clarity was able to kind of pivot me forward and say, okay, if this is what I'm working with, what am I going to do? And I started talking about it more openly, learning, what would trigger me and learning what would calm me down and learning how to deal with it. And like I mentioned earlier, um, since then I have decided to look into more of a natural medicine route to heal because a lot of this do go back to the gut. So I definitely have been dealing with gut issues and, um, like I said, other things like migraines and, and allergies and uh, these things are actually all tied together. And so, um, the craziest stuff can trigger this, right? It could be hormonal imbalances. It could be gut issues, mold exposure, like things like that, that you wouldn't really think of, but, um, can either worsen symptoms or really just exacerbate them so that they're, they're happening in the first place where they may not have been happening before. So I decided like, I, I was doing really well dealing with it, but I wanted to just like make it so that I had to deal with it as little as possible. And so I'm still on a healing journey. I'm still working at it every day and taking supplements and doing lab testing to kind of get to the root cause of a lot of this. But um, yeah, it's, it's made a huge difference in my life. <laughs> I'll say that for sure. Yeah, I used to get these terrible migraines and it didn't really help that I was living in, in southern Alberta just until about a month ago. But the other piece that I recognized, and it was really the biggest factor of all, was aspartame. And I would consume aspartame very, very rarely, but sometimes, you know, I wouldn't be super mindful in my 20s and I just would. I would have like a diet soda or I would chew gum or I'd have a mint and then end up with this migraine. And I had no idea, right? At the time, I'm just like, oh, I don't know what the cause is, but I, all I know is that this is horrible. Like I'm just staying in bed all day when this happens and I'm in yeah. such, such pain and, and nausea and the whole works. And it was the weirdest thing. I think it was a dentist or somebody that told me, you know, you should just chew gum to keep your saliva, you know, active throughout the day or whatever it was. And then as I was chewing this gum, I realized it was aspartame. I looked at the packet and I was like, oh, yeah, because I've heard about artificial sweeteners Mm -hmm. affecting. So, yeah, removing that was huge. That stuff, um, antibiotics, Advil. And for me, like, I'm like, I look back and I'm like, okay, none of this is a coincidence. Like I was having sinus headaches and migraines from allergies. So first of all, you take the allergy pills that I'm having that are sort of like suppressing my nervous system, the like the antihistamines I'm taking. Then the Advil that I was taking for like migraines. And like I mentioned earlier, I, I've had chronic pain in my neck and my shoulders for a while. So that, and then I had strep throat a couple times and I was on like a few rounds of antibiotics. That in the course of a, like th- two or three years, like no wonder that my gut was like, excuse me, please, <laughs> where did you do, what did you do with all of my good bacteria? Like stuff yeah. was confused. And again, some people listening might be like, why are you talking about like strep throat? This is very silly, but it's important to know that there are other factors. Like anxiety is something that um, I do believe in my family. It's genetic. Like 
other family members have struggled with it. It's something that we're basically predisposed to. But just because you're predisposed to something doesn't mean that you have to struggle with it and that the symptoms have to show. So that's where this part of it comes in because, you know, if you are like having foods that you're sensitive to or, you know, chemicals that you're sensitive to or, um, like I said, mold or gut thi- gut um, imbalances and things like that that can be causing the issues – This is all important to look at if you're able, because it can make a difference in how you are, um, how these symptoms are showing themselves. And again, it all comes back to wellness, right? Like it's, it's very holistic, but it all makes a difference. And so I'm not like a doctor. I don't particularly help people with that aspect of it, aside from just directing them into, um, the right place that I think might help. But it's important for me to share my story on that because I do believe that especially just in the music industry will often just correlate it to like creatives are depressed and anxious. That's just like how it is. And really there's a lot of factors to it. And certainly some of these things can be um, circumstantial and, you know, life events can happen and traumas can happen that trigger it. But sometimes it's just like other stuff (laughs) and other things that we can actually change and work at daily to really, really lessen our load and not have to deal with so much and feel better on a day-to-day basis. Yes, absolutely. I think when my anxiety was at its peak, I ended up with tonsillitis a few times or a couple times. So, you know, I didn't have to get my tonsils out or anything, but that was that was one of the side effects that uh, I didn't remember experiencing. So I, I relate. And to round out this interview, I'm going to get into three questions that I try to ask all our guests. And the first is, what are the biggest challenges you've overcome? The biggest challenges I've overcome? Oh, man. Um, I think that one of the biggest ones has probably just been um, dealing with going the unconventional route. You know, I yeah. always had my parents' support as an artist, and I understand that a lot of people don't necessarily have their family support. Um, but that wasn't even the unconventional route for me that the more unconventional part of it was deciding to be an entrepreneur. And I think that, you know, my parents thought, Oh, she's going to school for the music industry. She'll get a great job. And then like also do the artist thing. And it didn't take super long for me to be like, I'm out, I'm creating my own business. And you know, a lot of people, place their judgments on you when you decide to do something that is unconventional, whether it be an entrepreneur or be an artist. And I always say that being an artist is being an entrepreneur. So it's really the same thing. Um, but it can be hard to work through that and to, you know, work through not letting other people's judgments or fears or concerns that they're placing on you affect you. And so that was something that I really worked hard to overcome. It took a long time for me to be really comfortable doing what I was doing and not let, you know, like I said, other people's concerns or or fears impact me because I knew that I felt really aligned with what I was doing. Um, But I just had to work through the one ups and downs of like running your own business and transitioning into that. And two, just the, the mindset stuff that comes up when you're trying not to doubt yourself, but you know that everyone around you is like, kind of wondering, is this going to work out? (laughs) And that can be kind of hard sometimes. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily go away. I thought I was, you know, well past that point and thought that I was strong enough and and tough enough to deal with whatever came my way. And then it started showing up in more subtle forms where I didn't even notice that I was sort of being judged or, or maybe not even judged, just like there was subtle forms of communication that were happening that were negatively affecting and impacting me. And then I was like, oh, wow, it's because of the life path that I've chosen, which people don't understand. And I think uh, even my friends are only gradually beginning to understand me now, but they didn't before. Uh, They they definitely had their challenges with, with trying to see what I was trying to accomplish. And, you know, uh, that part of that is on me for not casting a vision that's big enough and wide enough to be encompassing enough for everybody involved because that's what it is it's the impact and the difference i want to make in the world it's not just for me and the money i want to make so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and what are the most significant victories you've experienced starting my own business (laughs) um i think that i mean that's been a huge one for me but i think also being able to just like be willing to learn and figure stuff out. When I was more deep into the artist side of things, I feel like I'm really proud of myself for just 
going for it, learning how to do the DIY thing, putting out music, booking shows, and really giving it my all. And I'm not necessarily, that's not my focus or my priority right now as far as my artist project goes, but it's something that I will always go back to and always enjoy doing. And I think that just going for it and being willing to learn is a big victory that we can all really celebrate. Yeah, I love that. Are there any books that have helped you on your journey? Oh my God, so many. Um, let's see. Great. One of my favorite is, well, on the on the wellness side, I love the rain barrel effect. That's a great one to start with for anybody who's interested in learning more about how like your wellness and your gut and everything can impact mm. mental health. Um, I'm trying to think. I really love You Are a Badass at Making Money. I think that these are not even music industry specific books, but yeah. they're things that are really tangential to the music industry because uh, I see so many people struggling with money and money mindset and things like that. So that's a, a great place to start if you do feel like you struggle with that. I'm trying to think of what else. It's like, I, I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> You've read a lot of books. Yeah, I mean, but sometimes things don't necessarily stick with me as long. I feel like I'm definitely more of an audible learner, even though I love reading books so much. So it's right. like, I got to balance it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's okay if it's not all music industry related. A lot of books and recommendations we've gotten have not been, yeah, even though there are some really great books in, in the music industry as well. And and I always love to hear just different authors, different books that, that people yeah. are getting into. But I have to be honest, I prefer the podcasts for the music industry because I feel like our industry changes so rapidly that yes. sometimes the books become irrelevant pretty quickly. Like I'm not going to lie. So I think podcasts, there's so many great industry podcasts out there and those are really awesome. Uh, yeah. I mean, if your strategy revolves around online marketing, which these days just seems inevitable, I mean, online is constantly changing. So yeah, by the time a book is published, uh, there's already aspects of it that are going to be outdated. You know, you don't want to put yeah. too many tutorials in there about how to use Instagram because tomorrow the interface could be different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for your time and generosity, Katie. Is there anything else I should have asked? No, I don't think I think you asked all great questions. And I think that, you know, if anybody is curious about learning more, all that I would say is make sure that you are listening to yourself, listening to your gut, and don't be afraid to ask for help, whether that is just from a friend, from a mentor, or by hiring an expert to help you through whatever you are going through, whether it is on the wellness side, or whether it is like strategy wise, but always listen to your gut. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Excellent. And where can we find you online? I am at Katie Zaccardi on Instagram. And that's also my website, katiezaccardi.com. So Instagram is the main place where I'm hanging out. You can follow me there. And then my podcast is out the out to be podcast. You can catch that on any um, platforms where you listen to podcasts. Okay, thanks so much, Katie. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's me. I wanted to add a bit of a personal touch to each episode of the podcast, so I thought what better way than to put together a bit of a closing segment, especially for these interview episodes. Not that you don't hear me waffle and wax eloquent plenty already. I don't want to keep you here any longer than necessary, so I'm going to keep these segments short and to the point. I'll share some thoughts and reflections from the episode, talk about something that has piqued my interest as of late, or, as I have often done, offer up a call to action. That segues nicely into what I'd like to share today. My question for you is, what do you do when you finish listening to a podcast episode like this? Do you implement any of the ideas suggested? If you have, and you've gotten any outstanding or surprising results from taking action, I want you to leave a comment in the show notes. Do you look for additional tools and resources on Music Entrepreneur HQ? With over 700 posts on the website, I would posit that it's a good place to look. Finally, do you invest in yourself? I'm going to be talking a lot about investing yourself in future episodes, but just for reference, in the last two years, I've put over $3,000 into my personal development and I wouldn't take any of it back. We're all a little weird about money and I get that limiting mindsets can have you thinking twice about opening your wallet as an artist, but if you've been tuning into these episodes and applying the ideas mentioned, you've benefited from it greatly. And it's time to take the next step. And that means investing in yourself not saying you've got to spend with me. If there's another expert you connect with or another course you've been hesitating to buy, go get it. 
it's no skin off my back. The key is to be in action. You've got to put your money where your mouth is. If your mouth is saying you want to achieve better results in your music career, then your wallet needs to naturally follow and move in the same direction. I'm saying this because I care about you and your goals. The way you're going to reach your goals is by putting money into resources that solve your problems. You don't want 2020 to be just another year. So it's time to get in the right headspace. And that means seeing your ongoing self-education as an investment rather than an expense. Okay? I appreciate every one of you. This is David Andrew Weeb, and I'll see you on the stages of the world. Thank you for listening. Music in this episode was brought to you by Brian Young. Wherever you're listening to this right now, please consider leaving a five-star review and comment to help us get the word out about the podcast. <laughs>